On December 26, 2003, a devastating earthquake struck the ancient city of Bam in southeastern Iran. Measuring 6.6 .6 on the Richter scale, the quake leveled much of the city, including its historic mud brick structures. Tragically, over 26,000 people lost their lives and tens of thousands were injured. Among the destruction were two hospitals that collapsed, severely hampering rescue efforts and leaving countless victims trapped beneath the collapse. To help prevent tragedies like BAM from claiming even more lives, MIT's Lincoln Laboratory and the University of Notre Dame developed Sprout, a soft, mind-like rescue robot built for navigating disaster zones. Sprout, short for Soft Pathfinding Robotic Observation Unit, is an inflatable robot that grows into rubble, twisting through tight gaps and dangerous spaces where traditional machines and even people can't go. At its tip, a camera and sensors stream real-time visuals to rescuers, helping them locate survivors safely from a distance. Up next, we'll talk to Dr. Nathaniel Hansen at MIT, one of Sprout's creators, to learn more about how this incredible robot was brought to life. Hey everyone, I'm Luke. And I'm Angie. And today we'll be joined by Dr. Nathaniel Hansen, a member of the Human Resilience Technology Group at the MIT Lincoln Laboratory, and a part of the team responsible for the creation of Sprout. So let's just get started with the questions. Could you tell us a bit about Sprout and how it's different from traditional robots used in search and rescue? Sure, thank you guys for having me on today. So Sprout is a novel robot that we've been developing for about the past year to assist in urban search and rescue scenarios. Um, and in comparison to a lot of other robots which have been developed for operations in austere environments, Sprout is what we call a soft robot. So there are parts of its construction that make the robot uh, soft and flexible, and that uh, that leads to different advantages in its form factor and its ability to get into very tight and constrained spaces. So it's made of di very different and novel materials, unlike you would find on most other robots, and that imbues it with uh, special abilities, which we'll talk about. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really fascinating approach. So what do you think is like your vision for for Sprout in the next couple of years? My vision for Sprout is that in uh, across the United States and the world, there are groups of people that are referred to as urban search and rescue task forces. And so when there is a natural disaster, such as an earthquake, hurricane, um, any incident where there's a form of structural collapse and people have to respond to that structure collapse incident to triage it, to understand are there people beneath the rubble? And if there are, how do we extricate um, and prioritize where we're putting people underneath this in the difficult collapsed environment? And so my vision for the future with this robot is, can we get one of these systems in the hands of every first responder team from the national level to the local fire department? So they have a new, uh, they have a new uh, asset in their toolkit that they can use to be able to sense and um, since and ultimately replace what would normally be a person who would have to crawl into some of these spaces where there's all kinds of environmental hazards um, and ultimately there's, a, there's always a chance of loss of life or limb. So if we can put these robots into places where there's going to be lots of danger to humans, I think that's a win and that's a future that we're trying to develop. Yeah, I think that's that's a great idea for the future. So you mentioned before that Sprout structure is inflatable. So what materials do you consider for the tube and how did you guys decide on the final one? Yeah, so so when we talk about this inflatable robot, so its main body tube is constructed of essentially a fabric tube that's turned inwards on itself. And then as we um, as we add air to that tube, the internal pressure forces the, the vine um, which is what we refer to the main base body, to avert. So it turns outward on itself and essentially it lengthens itself from the tip. So in constructing that body, we looked at a couple different engineering constraints. So we know that we needed to have a flexible fabric that could construct it. So it needs to be soft and deformable, but it also needs to be airtight. And so there's a couple of different fabrics that you could use to make an airtight, um, an airtight body like this. So we looked at a couple of fabrics, um, but we also looked at some uh, TPU, which is a type of engineering plastic, which is coated on top of a ripstop nylon. And we found that that led to a really nice mixture of engineering properties in so far as it's both airtight, so we can pressurize it, not have any leaks. Um, so we heat seal that to form an airtight body. 
but then also because the core fabric is, in it is ripstop, it's very durable. So it can handle uh, the types of conditions that we find in the collapse structure, such as scraping along um, jagged steel or concrete. Um, and some of these situations which would gradually wear down on the bodies of a fabric that was not as um, durable. So the, we, we looked at a broad spectrum of materials and once we really narrowed it down to that we we're going to use uh, ripstop nylon with TPU, it was just a matter of, of looking at sort of what's the best variation of those within that little subclass of fabrics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so further expanding on this kind of like uh, material and stuff, so we talked about uh, in robotics, which is like what we uh, in the robotics that we do, which is like VEX competition, right? We use mm -hmm. a lot of sensors. So then I kind of like was wanted uh, to talk about how like you guys use sensors in Sprout and like how you kind of protect those sensors, right? Because I know like there's sensors at the at the tip of the robot to help kind of like track and look for um, mm -hmm. people, yeah. Yeah, so there's, there's two different types of sensors that we use on the robot. So we're developing sensors that can go essentially along the body of the robot. So as the robot grows, it's this very long structure. Um, and we're, we have different ways that we can embed sensors along the fabric of the body. And so that leads, leads you to have some ability to have distributed sensing. Um, but then we've also been developing a, a type of sensor pod which essentially has a complex interlocking mechanism, which enables the vine to grow through it while keeping the sensor um, locked at the tip. And in that we have, uh, we have different type of imaging technologies, including a depth camera, as well as RGB camera. And we're looking to see what other kind of imaging modalities would be useful for search and rescue. But those are the two different um, so sensing paradigms that we use in, in Sprout. So we have, uh, like a heavier tip mounted sensor and then lighter sort of arrays of sensors that go along the body. Mm -hmm. So I guess we've talked a lot about like the successes and stuff. Can you tell us kind of like what was the biggest engineering challenges you guys faced and like how you guys ended up solving that? Yeah. Um, one of the things that you learn very quickly as a roboticist where you have to put things out in the field, um, you're going to find those edge cases. You're going to find new situations where um, the things that you assume about the way the world is constructed just aren't true. So oftentimes in oftentimes when you're in developing something in a laboratory environment, you're used to very clean air. You're used to very uh, controlled, climate controlled temperatures. Um, and so one of the first times that we actually took the system out in the field, like the very first prototype of this, we took it out on a day where it was 95% humidity, where it was probably also over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And some of the adhesives that we used to steal the body um, and to adhere different fabric motors to it. Um, like in a mid side heat, we had all sorts of different kinds of leaks and failures. Um, and so sometimes it's just learning and getting out into the field of and trying to emulate what kind of conditions you're going to see um, is really useful to understand, okay, now we need to go back to the drawing board and we also need to understand how do we improve our fabrication processes so we can build something that's uh, that's robust to these different types of environments. Because especially when you're trying to work in the realm of disasters and emergency response, nothing is ideal you're only ever going to have less uh, subpar conditions and so you have to be uh, prepared that you make sure your system is tested in all these different environments and something that we learned very quickly of hey we have to consider uh, not just if it works once in the lab doesn't mean it's going to work in the field or it's going to work every single time especially when we're trying to get feedback from first responders as they're using the system yeah i'm sure like that's a lot of uh... It's like uh, something that a lot of my robotics viewers can relate to, right? Because we like test stuff in our lab and, you know, a lot of times the mechanisms don't actually work during competitions and then you have to go through reiterations and really get that to work. So, yeah. yeah, so preparing and planning is definitely very important. So did you guys use any sort of CAD or 3D printing or anything to help you prepare or plan how you were going to carry out Sprout? Yeah, so as this was a 
as we went through a rapid prototyping uh, pr uh, process for this, um, everything that we have designed and built has been in-house. So we do a lot of 3D printing. Um, we're particularly interested in how do we make parts that are lightweight, uh, but also rigid and uh, water and dust and grass protected. So there's a couple different 3D printing technologies that we used. I particularly like using uh, carbon fiber reinforced nylon for very lightweight and strong parts. Uh, I think that's been worked that's worked really well, especially as we need to design parts with really small uh, features, uh, particularly supports for axles and bearings on like a camera mount that we have. Uh, so that's been my favorite technology of choice. Uh, for CAD design, um, I tend to like using that through to do all of my prototyping and um, building out systems and assemblies. So those are something that we're actually hope that we're going to be very happy to share in the near future, some of these designs, because we want other people to be able to use the base technology that goes into the Sprout robot to develop other types of technology for confined space search and rescue. Um, so some of those some of those assemblies and CAD files should be coming out in the near future. No, that's super cool. I think my I had a tiny audio cut. So can you repeat like what CAD software you used? Sure. Yeah. So for our our modeling and assembly build, we like to use SolidWorks. Uh, I know everyone's got their own particular flavor of CAD. I I learned SolidWorks, and that's what I use for everything. So those systems that we've designed and built. Um, some of those will be part of a forthcoming academic publication where we're excited to share some of the designs and open source some of the technology to enable others who are interested in furthering work on soft robotics, uh, soft robotics for search and rescue capabilities. Uh, those designs will be available in the near future. Yeah, and make sure to check down the description. There's going to be some articles on Sprouts. And for our next question, I kind of want to ask what kind of like feedback loop exists between responders and engineers during the testing phases that you guys went through? Yeah, so that's that's something that we've been particularly proud of with this project. There's a there's a great XKCD comic. I'm not sure if you guys know that comic series. Um, it's, uh, but there's a sort of a, a joke within people who work in disaster robotics that you design a cool robot and at the very end you want to justify why you built that system and so you like to say oh well it could be used in search and rescue after you've done all of your design and building and prototyping requirements engineering um, and that's often a case for a lot of people who are in academia so what we have been very proud of in our cycle is let's involve first responders in the process from the very beginning. So one of the first things that we did was take a system like the Sprout system that existed, which was basically a pure research, uh, like academic project, took out like version 0, 0.0 and put it in the hands of first responders and say, would this work? And they pointed out all sorts of uh, improvements that we would actually need to make to the system. So it would actually be fieldable. And for instance, like in this goes back to the comment about testing in lab versus testing the field, like the system that existed as like the baseline, it ran off of uh, 120 volt AC power. And it also required us to bring in a very loud and noisy air compressor to power it. And those are two things that in an actual emergency response scenario where there's people shouting and trying to coordinate in an actual emergency, no one wants a loud air compressor going off because that's just going to obstruct communication. And similarly, there's if there's just been a disaster, you can't assume that the infrastructure is going to be working. And so you can't rely on that there's going to be a plug that you could plug your robot. That feedback of, are these requirements practical? Um, by like bringing it out into the field has been helpful as well as the getting their insights of hey these are sorts of scenarios where our existing tool sets so the technologies that we would have to probe inside of a collapse structure like if you could show us like what's around this curve or, or through this hole like we've never actually been able to see in those places 
So those are things that they've been very interested in. And it's been some, like, as we've iteratively developed the technology further, we've seen a great excitement of, oh, like, not from, there's been excitement not only from the, oh, this is getting better and more advanced, but there's been a relationship built of these people are, uh, these, this, our team of researchers is taking into account the feedback that we've given them or that they've given us. And so as we, they, as we, they see that we're taking the things that they say seriously to improve um, our system as we go through different iterations, they're more willing to work with us because they see that we're trusted partners and we're willing to take their advice seriously. Mm, yeah, totally. I think that collaboration is really valuable. So let's just move on to the last question we're going to ask today. So what kind of skills do you would you suggest for high school students to focus on if they're trying to pursue this line of career? Oh, boy, that's a great question. Um, and I want to say also just for, like for the record, you guys are much further along than where I was in high school um, and coming into college. And so being where your knowledge of robotics uh, they, you guys are a lot further along that runway. But in terms of how do you get to be a robotics research scientist, which is what I am, it really takes someone who's a good interdisciplinary thinker. Um, it's not just mechanical engineering. It's not just electrical engineering. Um, when we refer to, like, to be a roboticist in our vein, you have to be what we refer to as like a full stack roboticist. And you that means you have to be comfortable jumping into SOLIDWORKS one minute to measure a part, design a new fixture. You need to be able to pull up code to maybe look at the drivers for a system and understand why the system's not booting correctly. Um, you need to be able to understand how the electrical system and the power distribution works if you're going to add in a new sensor. Robotics is such an inter interconnected, interdisciplinary domain. Um, and what I would really encourage people to do, especially um, uh, in aspiring engineers who are looking to like, what course should I take next? Or how should I design a major? I would say take something that's outside of your major. So if you're a mechanical engineer, take some programming classes so you can understand all the pains of what it actually means to get some code to compile. If you're a computer scientist and never have to touch any hardware, take a CAD course, like do things that are outside that make you are that, that make you a little bit uncomfortable or stretch your knowledge sets because you're going to have a greater appreciation for the full disciplinary aspects of what it means to be a roboticist. Uh, and I think it helps people from being pigeonholed into one specific discipline and it makes us better uh, cross collaborative teams. So think big, think interdisciplinary, and you'll be a great roboticist. Yeah, I think that's a amazing like response for that. And also that kind of makes me think about kind of like what all these robotic competitions has been push, pushing all these like high schoolers and college students into, which is kind of like collaborating within all these different like uh, disciplinaries, right? Where you have people who focus on CAD and then um, building like, the hardware and the electrical stuff and even programming, right? And also even like, uh, stuff like marketing and stuff and I think that you know what you said just kind of like backs that up super well yeah thank you so much for joining us here today and giving us some of your time wishing you your team sprouts and any future endeavors the best thank you, thank you so much for having me yep thank you thank you